number. Okay. Uh, we are reading from Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 2, text 28. Avyakta dini bhutani vyakta madhya ni bharata avyakta nidhanani eva tatra ka paridevana. All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in the interim state, and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? So then, accepting that there are two classes of philosophers, one believing in the existence of the soul and the other not believing in the existence of the soul, there is no cause for lamentation in either case. Non-believers in the existence of the soul are called atheists by followers of Vedic wisdom. Because the Vedas, they describe the existence of the soul. If we want to know about the soul, we have to get the knowledge from the Vedas. So somebody who does not accept the Vedic knowledge is called an atheist. Yet, even if, for argument's sake, we accept this atheistic theory, there is still no cause for lamentation. Apart from the separate existence of the soul, the material elements remain unmanifested before creation. From this subtle state of non-manifestation comes manifestation, just as from ether, air is generated, from air, fire is generated, from fire, water is generated, and from water, earth becomes manifested. <laughs> from the earth, many varieties of manifestations take place. So we have been reading in Bhagavatam how first everything is unmanifest. All the material ingredients are there. The elements are there, but nothing has its shape. And then slowly, slowly, how the elements become manifest from the, grow, uh, from the subtle to gross. So ether is the most subtle. So the e first ether is there. Then combination of ether with the sound, then we get the air. Then from air, then we are getting uh, fire. Then the combination of ether, air, and fire, we get water. Then the combination of ether, air, fire, and water, we get earth. And then from earth, we can see so many everything. Everything's shape we can see because it's the most grossest. Earth is the most gross. Take, for example, a big skyscraper manifested from the earth. When it is dismantled, the manifestation becomes again unmanifested and remains as atoms in the ultimate stage. So what Prabhupada is saying, okay, the skyscraper, we build it. So first the elements are not together. They are there in its atomic state. Then we start making, we make the glass, we mix all those ingredients to make the cement and the bricks, everything. Then we build the skyscraper. So before we started building, all these elements were there in the atomic stage. Then we built the, we combined the elements. Then we built the skyscraper. Then we destroy the skyscraper. Everything becomes atomic again. So what, what, is the, what is the harm then? When it is dismantled, the manifestation becomes again unmanifested and remains as atoms in the ultimate stage. The law of conservation of energy remains. But in course of time, things are manifested and unmanifested. That is the difference. Even modern scientists, they know that the total energy remains the same. It might just change the shape. But the total energy of the universe is, it, it uh, remains the same. So, then, what is cause for lamentation, either in the stage of manifesting or unmanifestation? So, it, they continue to exist. Krishna is saying it continues to exist. It's all atoms. If you're thinking there is no soul, it's all atomic. So, it existed as an atom. It was manifest for some time. Then, not manifest. So, then it's okay. Then, what's the difference? Then, what is the cause for lamentation, either in the stage of manifestation or unmanifestation? Somehow or the other, even in the unmanifested stage, things are not lost. <laughs> Both at the beginning and at the end, all elements remain unmanifested, and only in the middle they are manifested. And this does not make any real material difference because it's not that they are disappearing, 
it's not that they won't exist as the atoms anymore, only they're not manifest, but they're there as atoms. So this is the atheistic theory then. And if we accept the Vedic conclusion as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, that these material bodies are perishable in due course of time, antavanta ime deha, but that the soul is eternal, nitya shukta shari rinaha, then we must remember always that the body is like a dress. Therefore, why lament the changing of a dress? So if we understand that we are not the body, we are the soul. And we have been reading the characteristics of the soul, that the soul never dies. The soul it cannot be changed. The soul is eternal, always existing. And that is separate from the body. It's just the body that keeps changing. You know, so, and the soul, no matter how much we try to keep it in the body, no, at one time we have to give it up. We cannot stay forever in the body. So then Krishna is saying, then why are you lamenting? That is the, that, that's the nature. It's the, the soul gives up different bodies at it as we change different clothes. That's the nature. The material body has no factual existence in relation to the eternal soul. It is something like a dream. In a dream, we may think of flying in the sky or sitting on a chariot as a king. But when we wake up, we can see that we are neither in the sky nor seated on the chariot. Actually, the soul, we are the soul, we are not the body. We thinking we are the body, that's the dream. The dream is that we are thinking I'm the body. Actually, what is this body? It's just a combination of different elements. Earth, water, air, fire, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego, the different senses. That's what it is. And then when we leave this body, this body that we are so attached to, it's going to decompose and again remain in the atomic as the atoms of these elements. So are we the body, actually? But our thinking of that we are the body, that is why the Vedic wisdom encourages self-realization on the basis of the non-existence of the material body. Therefore, in either case, whether one believes in the existence of the soul or does not believe in the existence of the soul, there is no cause for lamentation for loss of the body. So if we think that we are not the soul, that we are just this body, then anyways, chemicals, why, why shall we, why shall we um, you know, lament for, for a bunch of chemicals which combine together? And if we understand that, oh, I'm not this body, I'm the soul. So then we will properly understand that, oh, so everyone else is also not the body, they are the souls, it's the soul that is important. So does it mean that in practical speaking, that if our loved one leaves the body, their body, then we should not cry and or we should not grieve or not lament and say, oh, anyway, you're not the body or the soul. No, we can't be unnatural. We can't be unnatural that, that we have to be practical. The lamentation will be there, but we will not be bewildered. As to the truth, we will understand, oh, yes, I was really attached to this person. And right now, this person is left. And what is le left behind is the body. And this person has gone on the onward journey. So, of course, the lamentation will be there, but we will not be bewildered. We will understand what's happening. We will not uh, yeah, be, be bewildered. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Shall we stop here for today? Oh. Any questions or comments on what we have been reading today? No, all okay. All okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining in today morning. Thank Bhagavad you. Gita ki jai, shlapam paad ki jai, gaur ki jai, hari hari bol, hari